Hello there, AP Human Geography students. Let's all learn about moving stuff around in the global economy. Okay, so the geography of transportation. There's a lot of different ways to move things around the world, and here are your five choices. You can use trucks. Those are short distance, best for one day delivery, but it's probably one of the more expensive form of transportation, surprisingly enough. Uh, and then there's trains. These are really good for long distance. Um, but they're uh, not very good for short distance. It takes kind of a lot of work to, to get a train from one place to another, and trains can't deliver stuff, or they can only deliver stuff to where there's train tracks. Trucks, on the other hand, can go everywhere where there's roads. Uh, ships. Ships are probably the preferred way to move stuff around the world because it's really low cost and you can bring it to the other side of the planet. Um, and I think I think you might read this in an internet resource eventually, but the cost... To fill a shipping container with 20 tons of supplies in China and then bring it to Long Beach in Los Angeles is, I think, $1,000. Uh, and you're like, that sounds like kind of a lot. But when you're shipping 20 tons of a product, uh, it's actually really, really cheap. Um, okay, and then there's air uh, travel or cargo planes. Uh, those are probably the most expensive way to move something around. But if you're just moving around because some kind of small package or something really delicate or something that is going to expire quickly, well, air travel, it's the choice for you. And um, I, I think a surprising thing a lot of kids don't know is that there's more cargo airplanes that fly around the world than there are passenger airplanes that fly around the world. Um, yeah, so like air, air transport of our stuff is a real thing. Uh, okay, and then there's pipelines. So pipelines are only used for liquids and gases, but if your goal is to just transport liquids and gases, uh, pipelines are pretty darn effective because, um, yeah, you just pump stuff down and just kind of keeps going forever. Uh, the problem is if there's a break in your pipeline at some point, uh, then you could spill out a lot of gas or a lot of liquid and maybe contaminate the environment. So pipelines are maybe a little dangerous for the environment in that regard. Okay, so that's how we move stuff around the world. Make sure you put all these things in your notes. So I know they're like white, but they should be they should be black as if they were in your notes. Okay, moving on. World trade. Oh, fun. So here's a map showing the intensity of shipping routes in our oceans. And we can see that the Western world is getting a whole lot of attention, especially uh, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, New York, really all up down the east coast of the USA, uh, all over the coast of Europe gets a lot of attention, all over the coast of Asia gets a lot of attention. And it looks like so much traffic goes through the Suez Canal here in Africa, and a lot of traffic goes through the Panama Canal here. But I want you to just imagine if we cut the world in half, it looks like probably 90% or more of all world trade is happening in the top part of our planet. And the bottom part of our planet, so South America, uh, Australia, and Africa, they're not getting nearly as much traffic as the top part of our world is. So I think that's quite telling of how world trade is working. Um, okay, the world's busiest ports. I think this is an interesting little little slide to point out. But the busiest ports in the world are Shanghai, Singapore, Shenzhen, Ningbo, Busan, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Kuangpo, Jabal Ali, Tanjin, and then there's a bunch of others on the next page. So Los Angeles is the biggest or busiest port in the United States, but we only have a fourth of the tonnage of Shanghai. That is unbelievable to me. Um, and almost all the busiest ports in the world today are Chinese ports. Um... And back in 2006, only three of the top 10 ports were located in China. And today it's seven. So the Chinese export economy is growing at an astronomical rate. Um, yeah, and China accounts for 40% of all international trade. And other East Asia is 30%. So it's just so much stuff is coming out of, of Asia and China in general. That's pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Um, cool. Yeah, the, the port of Shanghai moves more volume than the top five ports in the U.S. combined. Wow, amazing. Um, okay, and then here's world transportation patterns. So, and this map shows you something kind of outdated. It shows you that there's all these ships that are going around the bottom of Africa. And you're like, but Mr. Brown, that other map didn't show that. Well, this map is a little bit older. 
And nowadays, so many ships sort of skip the bottom of Africa by going through the Suez Canal. Because I think it was only in like 2015, so it's relatively recently, that they tripled the width of the Suez Canal. So it can now fit two cargo ships at the same time. So the Suez Canal is now a significantly better uh, uh, shipping route. Um, so Africa is now just kind of being totally, their sub-Saharan Africa is now totally being kind of neglected by the sphere of world trade. They're just being skipped over. Okay. And then, oh, the world oil choke points. Okay, this is something I'll hit up again in the political unit, but I'll bring it up now. Uh, if you ever decided to be a global mastermind and you wanted to ruin the world economy and just cause a lot of destruction and damage around the planet, there's maybe these one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there are these six spots on planet Earth. I guess it's sort of saying seven, but this, this one doesn't count. So there are these seven spots on planet Earth where, or six spots on planet Earth, where if you controlled them and if you prevented ships from moving through these choke points, you could just really screw over the world economy. Um, and if you'll notice, out of these six spots, four of them are in the Middle East, uh, which shows you just how kind of strategically important this part of, of planet Earth is for maintaining world trade. Um, but the only spot over here on our side of the world is the Panama Canal. I'm going to deep dive into that in a little bit. Um, the spot over here in Asia is the Strait of Malacca, which is basically right by the city of Singapore. Um, that's where all the ships go through. But yeah, if you were an evil mastermind and you somehow took over the city of Singapore and you said, you know, no more ships can come through here, then the world would be like really screwed. So yeah. And the other ones we got here are the Strait of Hormuz, the... Uh, straight leading into the Red Sea, the Bab el Medeb, uh, the Suez Canal up here, and the Bosphorus Strait by the city of Istanbul. All these are really, really important spots. Okay. So, yeah, what do each of these maps tell you about the USA? Write down an observation from each. Okay, so let's uh, zoom into these maps and just write down one observation in your notes. So, this shows you uh, the United States economic activity split in half. Half of our economic activity occurs in the orange. Half of our economic activity occurs in the blue. So what is this really saying? It's saying that these, what is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. These 18 cities have half of all the money that's made in the United States. Um, pretty, pretty incredible. Let's see if we can name these cities. So we got Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Bay Area, Los Angeles plus San Diego, uh, Phoenix, what is this, maybe, is this Dallas? Probably Dallas, I think this is Houston, might be Austin, um, and here is, uh, shoot, what's the big city in Wisconsin? Um, Minneapolis, no, that's Minnesota. Ah, oh, oh, sorry, Wisconsin, I've forgotten you. Or actually, no, this is Minneapolis, yeah, this is in Minnesota. Um, this one's probably... Probably Nebraska, maybe, maybe Lincoln. Uh, here's Chicago, Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, or actually maybe this one is, maybe this is Cincinnati. Um, and over here, this would be, wow, they don't even have Atlanta on here. That's surprising. Um, this would maybe be Charlotte, North Carolina, Miami, and then the huge cluster of our, our biggest cities in the United States, DC, uh, Baltimore, um, New York City, and Boston. Boston. Gotta love them. All right, that's where half all the money's made in America. Okay, home buying map in the United States. Let me zoom in on this a little bit more. So how expensive is a house? In Phoenix, you could buy, or how much do you need to earn to buy a home? In Phoenix, you can buy a home if you earn $43,000 a year. In San Diego, $100,000 a year. San Francisco, $147,000 a year. Jeez. San Francisco is the most expensive houses in the United States. And uh, it looks like things are generally cheap in Texas. St. Louis, pretty cheap. Cincinnati is real cheap, 33,000, wow. Pittsburgh, 31,000, bull. So yeah, some parts of America are way more expensive than others. Another thing to point out. And then the next one is the biggest employer by state. So Walmart, hello Walmart, you're definitely the biggest employer for like half the freaking country. Um, but then other states, looks like a lot of these are universities. 
you know, University of Michigan, University of Nebraska, University of Kansas, University of New Mexico. So a lot of universities employ a lot of people. Uh, we've got the MGM. So look, we're different. We're not a university. Uh, uh, Oregon has Intel. Um, Washington State has Boeing, the airplane company. Uh, a couple of these are health um, plans. Yep, medicine, medicine, medicine. Uh, Maine is randomly a supermarket. That's kind of unexpected. Um, yeah, New York State University. So it looks like universities and Walmart are kind of the big, big winners in employing people in the United States. And then a lot of uh, health uh, plans too. Hmm. Okay, moving on. All right, so uh, do different cultures have different patterns of movement? Yeah, and especially in regard to the economy, for sure. So these are travel patterns of people purchasing stuff in a Canadian rural economy and a Canadian Mennonite sect. So um, what do you get here? So if people are traveling all over the city to buy stuff, they're going everywhere. But if people are in a Mennonite sect, they're largely not going to travel that far away. So there's definitely different travel behaviors, shows that there's different action spaces with cultural groups, sometimes just the people that occupy even the same territory. Um, yeah, do you got to get this stuff in your notes? I, I don't know. I think you just got to know that, that different people will have different movement and different involvement in society. Like uh, a, a great example story I can bring up about this is when I was teaching high school at Rancho High School in North Vegas. I remember I was talking about the airport one day and a student told me that they didn't know where the airport was. And I was like, do you look up in the sky and you see airplanes? The kid's like, yeah. I'm like, are you, are you ever curious where those airplanes land? He's like, no. I was like, wow, okay, you just really don't care. Like you're really focused on your little bubble of your community in North Vegas and you're not ever gonna try to branch out to see what's out there. Um, yeah, and I also taught kids in North Vegas who've never been to the Strip in their whole life and they were born and raised in Las Vegas. I'm like, at some point, you're not curious? Like, what's what's over there? Why do all these people come and see it? But yeah, the kids just never left their, their part of town. Okay, so yeah, that's the difference. Some people move everywhere, some people don't. Um, okay, Ullman's spatial theory. Okay, oh, oh, this is a big one. So, Ullman's spatial theory. He had this understanding of why do people move around? Why do people interact with each other? Why do people buy things? Why do people get jobs? And his theory has three parts to it. Complementarity, transferability, and intervening opportunity. And I, I, you're, I'm going to deep dive in all three of those bits in the next uh, slides here. But um, a great way that I could present this is... You are a high school kid who lives in the kind of Southern Highlands area of Las Vegas. You want to get your first job. And let's say that your ideal job is to work at Chick-fil-A. Uh, the closest Chick-fil-A is kind of by Town Square. Um, it's a little far away. So you're like, hmm, well, I could work at Chick-fil-A or I could work at Taco Bell. Um, now, complementarity. Are those two jobs relatively similar and could you access both of those jobs and the answer is yes like you know you're a high school kid you don't really need to have a lot of experience you don't need to have a lot of education to work in fast food but then we get to transferability like is it easy for you to actually physically get to those places um well and maybe if you don't have a car it might be kind of hard to drive at the chick-fil-a but the taco bell you can walk to it from your house so maybe that's a reason why you should go for the Taco Bell. But the last thing is intervening opportunity. Let's say right next to the Taco Bell, they open up a brand new Chick-fil-A. Well, that intervening opportunity is definitely going to take precedent. And you're going to be like, whoa, I'm not even considering the Taco Bell anymore. I'm going to Chick-fil-A, but the one in Southern Highlands that's maybe going to get built. Okay, so let me now just cover it here too. So complementarity for two places to interact. They first of all have to have the supply for where the, there is a demand. Or in the case of jobs, you have to meet the basic requirements. Okay, Complementarity only applies when people want to talk to each other, when people want to hire each other, when people want to buy things from each other. Um, for example, I have no complementarity with a hair salon. I will never in my life go to a hair salon and get my hair done. I just don't, I don't care. I don't have the interest. Um, and alternatively, with, with jobs, 
I don't have the complementarity to work at a engineering firm. I've never got educated in engineering. It's just never going to work. So complementarity, it's saying that like both sides actually want to make a deal and want to have interaction. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, for example, Middle East makes oil. The U.S. wants oil. We're going to interact with the Middle East. That's complementarity. All right, now transferability. Can you actually get there? Is, a mo is there mobility in the commodity? Um, this could include both time and money. So, for example, um, would, you, would, it be, would it make sense for transferability for you to open up a paper mill in Las Vegas, Nevada? Probably not, okay? Not a lot of trees here. It would take a lot of time and money for you to cut trees, for you to drive them into Vegas, for then you to process it into paper. It would make so much more sense for transferability if you located your paper mill close to a forest. Just logical. Um, and then when it comes to jobs, like, you know, I, I know some teenagers who live in Southern Highlands that work at the Dairy Queen down the street from the high school. And the reason why they work there is because they're like, Mr. Brown, it's one of the only places I can walk to. I don't have a car. I couldn't physically go to another job. Um, yeah, and actually one of these guys I used to live with, he, uh, he didn't have a car and he kept saying, I want to get a better job, uh, but I, I got to use the bus or I got to use my bike. So I got to go to my existing crappy job. And I'm like, well, man, once you get a car, then the transferability isn't a problem and you can transfer yourself to wherever you can make the best deals and wherever you can, you know, make the most money and live your best life. So and that's, that's just the reality of living in the United States, especially in a city like Las Vegas. Like, you need a car. You just, you gotta be able to get around. So that's transferability in a nutshell. Okay, and the last thing is intervening opportunity. So closer opportunities will reduce the attractiveness of the interaction with more distant opportunities. So, uh, for example, um, I think the original water park in Las Vegas was also called Wet n' Wild, but it was located on the Vegas Strip. Then they relocated Wet n' Wild to the Southern Highlands area, and people from all over Las Vegas consistently came to Wet n' Wild. But in, I think, 2008, that might be too early, I don't know. But 2008, they opened Cowabunga Bay. And Cowabunga Bay is over there on the east, or yeah, on the east side of town. And so people on the east side of town are like, oh, we're not going to go to Wet n' Wild anymore because there is a closer intervening opportunity for our water park needs. So we're all going to now go to Cowabunga Bay and Wet n' Wild will be for the people on the west side of town. Um, so that's intervening opportunity, no doubt. Um, also, like this is another great example of an intervening opportunity. When Disneyland first opened in the 1950s, people from all over the United States went to Los Angeles and went to Disneyland and it was great and everyone had a great time. Um, but Walt Disney realized like, wow, a whole lot of people from the East Coast are flying all the way over here to go to Disneyland. What if I built a Disneyland on the on the East Coast to account for all that, all those people, and give them an easier intervening opportunity to enjoy a Disney theme park? So he built uh, Disney World in Florida, and the vast majority of people on the East Coast go to Disney World. The vast majority of people on the West Coast go to Disneyland. Just makes sense. And I think the same thing will happen in your jobs. Like, um, you know, I I currently do live really close to Desert Oasis High School, but. I don't know if somehow another high school opened up even closer than Desert Oasis High School, I would consider applying to it just because it would cut my commute by even a couple more minutes to work every day. All right, cool. So that's intervening opportunity. You want to go to places that are close by. Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay, so here's this is just kind of summarizing those same things again, but saying it in a little more fancy way. But Ullman's theory makes a lot of sense, okay? So once again, complementarity. Do the people even want to talk to each other? Do they have the requirements each side is looking for? Great. Transferability. Can you get there? Can you access their stuff? Um, because, for example, if, if we find gold and diamonds on Jupiter, there's just not a lot of transferability for us to get that valuable stuff off Jupiter, okay? Like, you gotta be able to physically move, you gotta be able to get there. And last thing is intervening opportunity. Uh, you're gonna choose a, a trade partner who is closer to you. You're gonna wanna just do what's, what's closest. Um, and I think you can actually apply a lot of these things to friendships as well. I usually talk to students about that. It's like, 
uh, if you had a best friend in the past, but then either the best friend moved away or you moved away, well, um, you are probably no longer have the transferability to, s to s keep your friendship going. And then there's going to be intervening opportunities of other kids your age who will kind of come into your contact and maybe they'll kind of grow in the friendship factor over time. Okay. So yeah, Omen's theory. It's saying that uh, people in Chicago, how do they get around? What do they do? So he, he kind of mapped it all out and said there's these patterns of interaction that people tend to do the most of. Okay, and this is definitely a part of his theory, especially with the concept of intervening opportunity. Um, but the friction of distance, the farther away something is, the less likely you'll go and interact with that group simply because of the time and money associated with transportation and communication. Um, like I have family on the East Coast of the United States. I see them like once a year. I have family on the west coast of the United States. I see them like eight times a year. It's just because they're closer, okay? Like, I really like my cousins on the east coast, but they're just not not around. Um, but friction of distance, this was way more true in the past. But today, I mean, if you really want to keep a relationship alive or if you really want to keep a connection going, uh, now we've got the internet and cell phones and so the friction of distance isn't as big of a concern as it used to be okay cool check it out so level of interaction more interactions the closer things are less interactions the farther things are away like for example i talk with my roommate every day and i don't talk to my best friend every day but it's just because my roommate's in my house with me and it's like what's up pandemic hey all right and then number of interactions Less interactions, the further things are away from each other. So yeah, apply this to your own life. You know, who who in your life have you interacted with less because they're simply not near you? Okay, and then, yeah, that's kind of the same thing with how international trade works. We tend to have these trade patterns where uh, if you're closer to these kind of trade companies or these trading uh, ugh, countries, you will make more money. That just tends to be the case. Okay, so one-off activity slides. Let's get these. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll save this for a final video. Okay, peace out.